It is good to be in church the Sunday ahead of Thanksgiving to celebrate the child, to sing, sing uh, as we have today. I, uh, it is, you know, a wonder to go into th- the Thanksgiving week. It's uh, among my, my favorite holidays, as we call them, because it's good and biblical. Every, when the harvest time, the, the scriptures have said to bring those first fruits in, to bring the fullness of the harvest in and, and rejoice before the Lord. It also is in our wisdom, something that, you know, we, we have managed to keep it kind of simple. We're, we're supposed to fix some good food and get together with people we love and be glad. And, uh, and we, for the most part, we do that. Uh, it, it's just thanking people who last Sunday and last weekend actually carried on uh, my work. Uh, Cindy was in the hospital. She is at home and getting better bit by bit. We had got her out last Saturday, uh, but I missed a wedding and I missed a funeral and church. And so glad for a church that, that uh, covers these things and, and, and handles it with the, with the skill and the class that you did. And, uh, and also, we would want to remind that uh, you, you, Don and Kathy Gibson both at home sick. Uh, Kathy had a turn to the hospital, and uh, now they, they both have a COVID diagnosis. And, and at home, fine, keep them in prayer. And, uh, and also, kind of remember Dave Rankin. Uh, we also are collecting up cards to take out to Tom Corns. Uh, there's a little basket there that, that we're hoping to just keep him encouraged. You can... And there's so many people on the prayer, prayer list that uh, I'm going to read the scripture and we're going to have a time of prayer. The scripture begins in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 9, with the word not. And it says, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Lord, we know that, that our walk is, is prepared for us, that you have gone ahead, that you've visited our lives with your graces, you've prepared events and, and resources for us, Lord, to, to do your will and serve you in this world. Lord, we come today with the things that, that we call upon you for help. There are sick that need healed. There are bodies that are, that are weak and, and hearts that are discouraged. We ask, Lord, that you lift them up, touch them every one. Lord, bless the households that are here. Lord, we're thankful for the people you've put in our lives to love us, for the the plenty that we can rejoice in this week and the opportunities we have had. But Lord, bless those households that that need your healing touch, either whether there be strife or sickness or darkness, despair or grief. And we ask, Lord, also that you bless this community. Come alongside it. Be, be, be upon it in, in hearing the prayers of the people here. Bless this church to love and to serve you well. Lord, we ask for the church that is not free in places throughout the world, in North Korea, in China, in Vietnam, and so many Islamic nations, and in, nations, and in countries torn by civil strife. Lord, we, we ask that these Christians who cannot worship free and in open, that they would know your love and your power and answered prayer. Be be with us, Lord. Hear the individual silent prayers that we lift before you, the people we name in our hearts. And Lord, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Would also say, as I take my place over here where I usually stand and preach, um, there is a a service uh, for a World War II serviceman, man, Emmett Schwartz, uh, who came from this town and also was a member of this church. Uh, he, he was, uh, his body was never identified, recovered uh, at, when he lost his life in 1945. And uh, his body has been recovered. And there's a service at 1 o'clock this afternoon. I'll be part of it. Uh, and just so that you know, that, that information is in there, but has been moved to Emmanuel Lutheran Church so because of the weather forecast. So it is good to remember uh, a moment like that in a family and uh, that they can finally know that their loved one has, has been brought home. Now, the verse I began with, and, and you're here in verse 9 and 10 because it's, it's a while back that I ever preached out of uh, Ephesians chapter 2, uh, 6, 7, and 8. And uh, if... 
if you're asking yourself, is he planning to, to just stomp all the way through Ephesians to the end? Well, yes, over time I will do exactly that. Okay, so, you know, and, but we are on chapter 2, 9 and 10, and it begins with not as a result of works so that no one can boast. And so we are a bit mid-sentence. And because, and, but verse 8 is a, is a verse that you know, uh, that, that you should have heard of in this, in this idea, in this business of living for Christ. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. And so we have that great, great uh, testimony to, to what Christian faith is all about, is this is something that God has given. I haven't earned it. The salvation, the place in heaven, the, the God's hand on my life aren't things that I've, I've uh, gotten a, a list of things done and there, therefore God responded. God came first with a great gift of God's grace. And then Paul says, it's not by works. So that no one can boast, and I guess we're glad because uh, almost, almost nobody would sign up to hear somebody boast. No, we, don't, we don't generally do that as normal Americans. Um, if Usually if I praised you for something good that you did, you would say something like, well, I don't really, just, just you know. That's how we act. Now, now, when Paul says, not by works, so that no one can boast, you... You know, this, the, we're going to look at a, a couple of the, of the words here, and this one works uh, because the, the, the letter of Ephesians, as all Paul's letters, is written very carefully, and the Greek language draws a picture of what you're supposed to see, and it, this one isn't surprising where, where I would say, well, it says works, but it really means, and name something that you have no idea I, I was going to come out with that, it means work. It means it has connotations of employment. Now take, let that sink in for a little bit because, yes, if you love your job, you will never work a day in your life. Oh, you know, I've, I've got that job. I really have been in that job all this time, and, it, and, it's, and it's not work. It's calling. It's a, it's a life. And, and for that, I'm blessed. I've had jobs that were, frankly, work, okay? And so think that it, this, it, this is meant to give you a picture of employment. It's not from this work like work that you do so that you might boast. Now, do, do we now and then boast about the, the job that we do? I, I, I have had that occasion, not as a pastor. I think, I think, you know, I get amongst groups of pastors and they'll say, Oh, I remember when praise teams became the thing. They'd say, oh, we have 10 minutes of praise and worship to start our service. And the next pastor just, he doesn't say, well, that's nothing. But he just does chime in and says, we have 20 minutes of praise and worship in our service. And then the other one standing here says, we have 45 minutes of praise and worship. And I, oh, no, don't, don't do that. But I would boast, you, you, you grew to boast about your job. I remember... The, the chemical factory that I, that I took in Europe really entered the workforce. You know, union, eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, you know, and, and on, a, on a schedule on that factory work uh, was, and I was sent to, out to, to work in Building 62, I remember the name, and, on, and it was, of course, it was this time of year in 1979, except it was night shift, and it wasn't actually in Building 62, it was in outside of. And so you are standing outside on a, on, a, on a platform beside a railroad car, and it's snowing, and it's dark, and you're there for four hours before lunchtime, go get warm, and you do say to yourself, well, this here is why you get a college education, you know, so this, something else can happen besides standing out here in the snow. And we were, of course, we were grinding coconut shells. Ask me later why we were grinding coconut shells, but bosses want weird stuff. So I ground, ground coconut shells for, for day after day, night shift. And by slicing the bag open, the bag you dragged off a railroad car, hopefully, dumping it in the conveyor, which went up into building 62. And I wasn't real good at the job. And, or more likely, they kept comparing me to how many bags of coconut shells the first shift people did, which was always like 220. And I was always like 140 or something like that. Not because I wouldn't lift bags of coconut shells. That was fine. 
but they were 100 pounds anyway, but because they had help, they had daylight, they had people bringing the things to them, and they had a manpower man helping them, but it still was like, how come you didn't get as much done as first shift, and and how come the equipment always breaks down for you? I don't know. I'm driving the forklift and the wheel falls off. I didn't <laughs> do that. And you know, and you would, you would pour it in and then the thing would clog and you'd have to go dig out the bottom of the green elevator. It was a miserable job in in many ways. And I and I went on from that in indoors, eventually in the laboratory, had a had a marvelous time. But I learned to boast about my job because I was afraid of losing my job. I learned to boast about my job. You know, this is how I got done. This will document what I had, what, what I accomplished. These were the goals and this is what was met. And you also a certain amount of covering your tracks, making sure, and a certain amount of the constitutional right to complain about how the shift before you left the place, right? <laughs> Got to do that boasting about your job. I'm doing a good job. And, and if you, you know, if you're looking for, for a raise or recognition or, or promotion or, or some added resources from your company, you want to sell yourself a little bit, you know, accomplishments, uh, you know, these, this is documented, this is how I'm valuable to this company. And apparently none of that washes with God. Not by works, your employment, you know, your daily tasks that you go do for God because we don't want any boasting going on. We're humble people. We're people that give glory and thanks to God. And this was different than what the, the world would have said. I mean, we do a lot of crediting ourselves at times. I've, I've never, I can't remember ever asking for a raise maybe 50, 40 years ago, but anyway. But we do that, and the pagan world especially understood that even to the gods, you boasted. You, you, the Greek hero was not shy. And, and you, you might be reading the Iliad about they're going to go to Troy and they're gonna, gonna attack Troy because the gods told them to attack Troy. And it's, they, they loaded like 50 cows on their boat, which we think would be odd. They were the sacrifices. So you could park that boat, sacrifice all 50 of those cattle, and turn to the God and say, do you see what I've done? And here I am with my army to attack this city the way you took. In other words, God, you owe me. You owe me answered prayer. You owe me blessing. You owe me success in my endeavors. Look at what I have done for you in this is the context in which Christianity went out and said, no, you've got it backwards. You're just in thankfulness for everything God has done. God is not interested in hearing all that you've done for him. You haven't done anything in comparison to what he's done for you. This is a great gift of God. You should be writing thank you notes every day. Like if it's a gift, that's a thank you note. It's a gift every day. But there is a different kind of accounting to the person you work for that's more positive. If you wanted to talk to your boss about, again, I never asked for a raise, but a couple of times in my whole career, not certainly not the preaching career, but if you're looking for more confidence, more support, more resources, you could talk about all that the firm has invested in you so far, how they have trained you, how they have put time and resources into you already. You could talk about your commitment to the vision of the organization. You could talk about how you are a good representative of that organization to the, to the rest of the world, the community. You could talk about your passion for the work. And it turns out actually the company I worked for, for, for you know, had, had put me in the laboratory. They were looking for exactly that. They were, the boss would respond to that. You know, you've trained me to in, in quality control for, for in this business, and now you've got, got me on, on one of the dozen people in the country who knows how to do this. Um, they were looking for people with a passion for selling that product and meeting the customers. They were looking for people who are excited to, to work weekends and evenings, people who would just jump on a plane and travel and talk to that customer and nail that down. They were looking for all that, and actually, 
That's when I looked at it and said, well, if I'm going to be 100% in, if it's going to color my whole life, it's going to be what I am all about, I've kind of got a choice. It's either there or the church. And here I am. That's how that actually turned out for me. It was as clear a choice as it could possibly have been. Now, this business of telling the one for whom you work, reminding them what they have invested in you, of, about how you represent them, about your passion, your heart. Now, that's all through the Bible. Really, it is. Not for our sakes, but for your name, O Lord. There are lines like that all through the Old Testament. There are times when we say to God, your miracles in the past... You have done your great works for Israel and saved us from Egypt and, and defeated our enemies before us and established your son, son David in Jerusalem as king. Uphold that, God, for that is what has been done. You know, it brings, brings to mind that, you know, you can take a, a spot in like Psalm 40, which, which usually you're reading it and saying, well, that's nice or something. But I'm, I'm at 40 verse 6, it says, in sacrifice and offering you have not delighted. Again, that's very biblical. But you have given me an open ear. In other words, God, my heart is open to your vision for this people. That's, that's what I'm about. Listen to me, God, and, and support me. Come alongside, hear my prayer. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. We're saying it again, but it said, Behold, I have, the, I have come, and in the, in the, in the scroll of your book it is written to me. In other words, Lord, you have chosen me. You have called me out of the world, and I stand, and people know that I am one of your people. You've invested your name in me. Therefore, Lord, hear my prayer. And verse 8, I delight to do your will. Oh, my God, your law is within my heart. In other words, God, I'm not just getting up and saying, oh, what does God want me to do today? Oh, no, I'm saying I delight to do this. I'm sold out on your project. I'm excited. My passion is here. And you can say that genuinely to God, and it is a prayer that's biblical. That's the closest we can come to boasting, and it's not. It's saying, God, your message has overtaken my heart. This is what I'm all about. This is what you have done in my life. Oh, I'm thankful for the great gift. And therefore, you and God can go forward. And that you can go forward the right way. Because God is not so much going around, not at all saying, well, I saved you. And you ought to be grateful about that. Well, I guess, yes, we ought to be grateful, absolutely. I mean, you know, and, and, uh, and you can get devotion books that say you should have an attitude of gratitude and it is Thanksgiving week. And I won't say a word against giving thanks. It's just an important Christian holiday because the rest of the world, we can't ask them, thankful to whom are you? And we can say, I know who I'm thankful to. And this is an awesome thing. But... God is not so much looking out to make people have a permanent mood of thankfulness. That's not what I'm reading in here. I'm reading about the Lord who is reaching for tools. Because it says here in, this, in verse 10, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand. There's another way, another word to look at which God prepared beforehand. Um, Thanksgiving week, we could talk about recipe, but it's not really the recipe word. Different word. Picture a word that vision draws up founding a city, building and making a public park, building a stadium. In other words, founded a place where the things that God wants to see happen where the life of God is given flesh and takes place. Talking about us, he's talking about preparing us to be a place where his heart is expressed, where if there are good works and blessing and care and mercy to go out into the world, it's going to take place in your life. Paul is talking about what you're made here to do. And he says, you know, not by works so that no one can boast, not this, not that, but... You are prepared beforehand as God might found a great city where his life, his activity will happen. 
This is what we're prepared to be. This is what we're created to be so that his life will take place in us. And on the subject of good works, which comes up in this, doesn't it? That we should go, go forth and there should be good works showing up in our lives. It says, because it says right there, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. He is giving you a blueprint in the word given by the St. Paul of what your life is to look like. And we should pause. Works. These things. It is not where you're going to say, well, what did God want me to do? Oh, he wanted me to teach Sunday school. Oh, I taught Sunday school. He said I should read my Bible. I read my Bible every day. He said I should sing that song. I don't like that song, but I sang that song. I should get to church. What time is it? Oh, man, okay, I'll get to church. And he said I should be on this committee and go to this meeting. I went to every single one of those. No, you're not doing that. You were created for this. This is what you were born again to be. And so it is an expression of genuine expression of the relationship you have with Jesus right now. At best, it is Jesus' life bearing fruit and being expressed through you. You're not saying, well, I did this, hope God's happy. I didn't do that. I wanted to, but I didn't. No. You're able to say, God touched me. He touched me and made some things possible in my life that were never possible before. Shackled by a heavy burden, neath the load of guilt and shame, then the hand of Jesus touched me and now I am no longer the same. There are things possible to me. There is mercy that can go out. There is forgiveness that can be shown. There are good deeds done generously. There is a mildness to my temper. There are things impossible to me now that were always a, big, a distinct possibility. Flare-ups of anger. And moments of envy, times when I would just really want, no, this is not possible. And the heart has been take, that has been taken over by Christ. This is a picture of the born again life, is that here we were, but then the hand of Jesus touched us, and all this begins to flow out of our life, and to such an extent that the world is saying, where did that come from? It is not a job. And it is not works. As I said, at the right job, you never work a day. If you're born again, you live for Jesus every day. Because it's not that I'm saying, okay, the pastor was very firm, I gotta do this. Oh, I'm gonna do it. Make a face too. Make sure people know you're trying hard. <coughs> no. Because there are things that come easy because they come by our very nature. If one is born again, if a man be born again to see the sin, a man must be born again to see the kingdom of God, said Jesus. How much effort do you expend in being yourself? I got up this morning and looked in the mirror and without even trying, I saw myself the same funny face that's always been there. Praise God it doesn't age quickly or we look in the mirror and say, oh, what happened? You know, but it's the same face without any effort on my part because that is who I am. That's what I am expressing. And I don't have to get up in the morning and say, I have to, I have to become a Harley. No, I already am. The person who is in the hands of God and his heart and spirit have been made alive when they were dead and held by the presence of Christ has a nature that is expressed and it is not expressed as a work, but as a fruit. For it does say here, we are his workmanship. Oh, I love, that's my favorite bit of the whole verse. His workmanship. God's workmanship. Well, that's really raises, that, that makes you think, so think again about the people in church beside you. They're God's workmanship. That's pretty awesome. In fact, let's go one more Greek word. That's your, it's poema. You are God's poem. 
God's song. It's a very different word than something God did. There was a word for doing stuff. If I was going to vacuum the carpet, which I've never vacuumed the carpet in this church at all, but if I was going to vacuum the carpet, it would, you know, you'd push it here and push it there, and oh, I got to get that stuff over there, got to do that, I got to get the attachment out and suck up around the corners and stuff. That's doing. Poema is how trees do fruit just by their nature. Doesn't get up in the morning and say, God, I'll make fruit. It doesn't say apple, apple, apple. No, it just comes from the nature and the life that is within it. This teaching is about, you know, what God is planning to do in your life is going to come because his nature is now implanted in your life. His life is the source of what you are doing. And so we aren't doing that kind of work. We are God's fruit, his poem, his song. What is in his heart is being expressed in us. His passion for, for the kingdom he's establishing on earth is expressed in us. His love for his son whom he gave to us is being expressed in his love for us and his son being displayed in us. It is like, you know, it's what God means to have the world experience he wants to see going on in us and he's working on making that happen. I mean, I, I, I like to to watch a songwriter whose songs I like, have, see him interviewed, and people will say, I really love that song. How did you come to write it? And the songwriter will talk about, well, I was here, and I was feeling this, and this came to my mind, and the song was on my heart, and it just, sometimes they'll say it just wrote itself. You know, there's been people delivering pizzas who had to call their boss and say, I've got to go home and write a song for God, man. And, you know, I know the guy who did that. That, that is from my heart, and it's what expressed. You'd never hear a songwriter saying, well, it's about love, but my heart was filled with hate, and it's about... It's about joy, but I was about as blue as, a, you know, down on life and despairing as I could be. No, songs come from the heart of the songwriter. You are God's poem. You're, what is happening in your life is what is flowing from God's heart. And you are, another way to look at workmanship, his masterpiece, his one of a kind. You know, the, the workman that is a master worker, doesn't make things all the same. The one who great, creates a great painting doesn't paint the next painting just exactly right, uh, the same. It is new, it has, has nuances, it has shifts and change and emphasis, all expressing the heart of the artist. My brother-in-law, Jim, is a machinist. And since we have a work theme this week, you know, he, he, he says the job he recently retired from was making little parts for, well, actually something you all buy, but I won't mention. But anyway, um, little parts, you know, and, and it wasn't a big machinist job, and it was Jim's great grief. He says, we make so much scrap. You know, like 20 to 30% of everything coming off our machines is the wrong size, wrong spec. It's ill-made. We have to toss it out. It's a wonder anybody in this country makes money the way they carry on. Broke his heart as a machinist who likes to see things just right. But he does that job, and the aim is to make it all the same. But at this point, Jim is also building a race car. He does it every winter. When he turned 70, his doctor said, you shouldn't race anymore. He said, oh, I'm going to race a car anyway. <laughs> Enjoying him, enjoy himself. Of the race car, there are tiny tolerances. He takes everything apart and cleans it up just exactly right. And you know, none of those engines are exactly the same. None of those cars are exactly the same. The, the ideal race car is just sewn together to think about, to consider how each tire grips the road and how the power is transferred from the engine to the wheels. It is a unique masterpiece an individual creation. You are that. He is pouring his love into the world and coloring and giving tone and shape to that love through your life in a marvelous way. It is no wonder then 
that God's ears are open to our prayers, that his eyes are on us for good, that his blessings surround us, that we see so much to be thankful for, for, for and that we can count on his love and care. For he's all, doing all this so finally we may walk in these good works. Let it be our life's journey that each day presents another opportunity. Each passage of times means God will bring another challenge, another set of circumstances, another open door for us, for this is what God has prepared us to do. And there's nothing more to say, but is your heart one that prays, God, I am yours? Let us pray. Lord, we ask that you give us this life to live before you, expressing your love, bearing your name. Lord, and we do know that there will be hard things, there will be dark times, there will be thankless tasks ahead for those that bear the cross. And so, Lord, if, you know, if, if my friend, if God is calling your heart to respond to that, say, Lord, I'm yours. Call me to this task. Pour your heart through mine. And that's your hand up for that. That's what your, your family needs to see. That's what your community and your work, your, your people at work need to see in you. But there's also that, that this needs to be flowing from a born-again life. Lord, recognize, we thank you, Lord, that you met us when our spirits were dead, when our past was covered in sin, when our guilt was greater than we could bear. And through the blood of your son, Jesus, this is forgiven. This is made possible. Through the Holy Spirit, there is new life. If for you, you haven't committed your life to Christ, turn from the last life, which is, which is a mess anyway. Turn from, from your own, look, seeking your own credit, for you have no credit to give. And ask God for the forgiveness and the new life that his son brings to be, change your heart, make you born again. This is, this is that day for you. He has called you to this point in this place to respond to him, say, yes, Lord, forgive my sin, send me Christ. And Lord, what we have committed before you, what we have vowed today, what we have promised and how we have praised may be affirmed in heaven and before your throne. In his name we pray, amen. The altar is open for prayer. If you're praying at this side, I'll know to come and pray with you on this side. You can pray by yourself. So I'll respond in love and praise to God.